Vincent Anderson, General Counsel to CARICOM, Her Honor Mrs. Indira Ramrika Singh, Deputy Chairman of the Environmental Commission, the Court, Mr. Over London, Chief Secretary of the Tobago House of Assembly, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, excuse me, members of the media. It is my singular pleasure to welcome you to the national launch of the Environmental Commission's informational material. Your attendance in such large numbers is sincerely appreciated. The Commission, inaugurated on November 16, 2000, is now in its fifth year of existence, a relatively short period of time in the life of any institution. The Environmental Commission of Trinidad and Tobago is proudly the first of its kind in the region and one of the few in the world. Please permit me to give a short background on the establishment and jurisdiction of the Environmental Commission. The Environmental Commission is a superior court of record established by the Environmental Management Act 2000. The Commission has an official seal that shall be judicially noticed and has, in addition to the jurisdiction and powers conferred upon it by the Act of 2000, all the powers inherent in the Superior Court of Record. The Commission has the power to enforce its own judgments and orders, and the same power to commit for contempt as the High Court of Justice. The Act provides that the Commission consists of a Chairman, a Deputy Chairman, and four Commissioners. His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, appoints the Chairman and Deputy Chairman who are required to be attorneys at law of at least 10 years standing. He also appoints the other commissioners who are appointed from among such persons as appear to the president to be qualified by virtue of their knowledge of or experience in environmental issues, engineering, the natural sciences, or the social sciences. The commission has the power to hear and determine a number of matters provided for under the Act of 2000 which include, among other things, the jurisdiction to hear and determine appeals from decisions or actions of the Environmental Management Authority, more popularly called the EMA, applications by the EMA for the enforcement of any consent agreement or any final administrative order, and the complaints brought by a private party against any other person for a claimed violation of an environmental requirement. These complaints are known as direct private party actions. In addition to its adjudicatory powers, the Commission has been given the power to resolve disputes using Alternative Dispute Resolution, ADR. The ADR process selected by the Commission for resolution of disputes is mediation. Mediation is a non-adversarial process where the parties in dispute are encouraged to negotiate a settlement of their dispute with the assistance of a third party neutral, the mediator. Members of the commission conduct mediations. In keeping with its status as a superior court of record, the commission's work is supported by the registry whose head is the registrar. The registrar of the commission is an attorney at law appointed by the Judicial and Legal Service Commission. The commission's registrar is Mrs. Nicole Ramcharan Ramdas. I trust that my short lecture on the establishment and jurisdiction of this institution has assisted you in recognizing and understanding that the Environmental Commission is a court of law. A court, however, that is uniquely different from, for example, the High Court of Justice in that its membership is multidisciplinary. The High Court of, so, excuse me, the composition of the Commission, a specialist court is uniquely beneficial because of the types of matters that have been filed and are likely to be filed at the Commission. Some of these matters will contain evidence that are highly technical and scientific, can have issues dealing with public health, and of course, not to be left out are the legal issues that inevitably arise. The scientific and technical experts on the Commission are in a position to effectively evaluate the evidence so that the court's decisions will be balanced having regard to all the facts and issues presented. There has been much said that the Environmental Commission has no work and thus has been doing nothing. You may well ask, what has the Commission been doing? The Commission has been working. 
The court uses case flow management techniques and thus does not measure its work by the number of trials. The commission without trial has settled most of the matters which have come to the court in mediation. Mediated matters tend not to make legal news. I'm happy to report that there are no part heard matters before the commission. However, it is true that the court is greatly unused. The commission is a creature of statute with a limited jurisdiction. Consequently, the commission's jurisdiction and the caseload are dependent on the written laws conveying jurisdiction upon it. Apart from the Environmental Management Act 2000 and the subsidiary legislation passed thereunder, no other pieces of legislation exist which will contribute to the commission realizing its full potential. We at the Commission look forward to the enactment of the air pollution rules, the water pollution rules, the hazardous waste rules, and the Beverages and Plastic Containers Act, which would establish jurisdiction in the Commission to hear disputes arising thereunder. The enactment of these pieces of legislation will go a long way in ensuring that the Commission meets the mandate for which it was established. I submit that that mandate consists in the area Consist with the is consistent excuse me, with the policy of the government of Trinidad and Tobago which declares inter alia in the preamble of the Environment and Management Act that the government of Trinidad and Tobago is committed to developing a national strategy for sustainable development. Being the balance of economic growth with environmentally sound practices in order to enhance the quality of life and, and meet the needs of present and future generations. To accomplish this goal of sustainable development, the Commission is cognizant of the very delicate role it must play. We have been working assiduously to ensure that we are prepared and suited to the tasks that lie ahead of us. Over the last 12 months, we have undergone in-house training in judicial decision writing facilitated by, by Madam Justice Monica Barnes, retired, a three-day workshop in judgment writing facilitated by Dr. James Raymond, of the United States of America, a writing expert. Dr. Raymond has conducted regionally similar workshops for the Supreme Court of Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, and the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. I wish to express the thanks to the Embassy of the United States of America for facilitating the attendance of Dr. Raymond. The Deputy Chairman, Her Honor Mrs. Ramrika Singh, attended the Environmental Law Center of the Vermont Law School, Vermont, USA, where she participated in the course on alternative dispute resolution and the environment. With one exception, all the commissioners are certified mediators. Her Honor Anne Marie Serju attended a conference on environmental sciences in New Orleans, and in my capacity as chairman, I participated in a capacity building visit to Winnipeg, Canada, the Canadian International. Development Agency and the Institute of Public Administration of Canada made this visit possible. We at the Commission are mindful of the fact that we perform judicial duties and therefore embarked upon the task of drafting a code of conduct which, though non-binding, will inform the manner in which we conduct ourselves as members of the Environmental Commission. Training was not limited to the Commission's members but extended to its staff who participated in a four-day workshop hosted by DRA Consulting on professionalism, professionalism in the workplace. A code of conduct was also prepared and adopted by the staff. Everyone at the Commission is mindful of his or her responsibility as a member of a superior court of record and staff of such a court that he or she has pledged him or herself to a higher standard of behavior and performance. While we are poised and ready to discharge our responsibilities, we have, however, recognized that the Environmental Commission is a little-known institution in Trinidad and Tobago. In a bid to enlighten members of the public about the existence and jurisdiction of the Commission, over the last year, we invited various stakeholders to meet with us. These meetings were fruitful. We nonetheless acknowledge that that approach was limited and that there was a need for a higher level of visibility for the Commission. There are members of the public who may have heard of the Commission, but many of them are of the view that it is either the Environmental Management Authority or a department of the EME, or even a department of the Ministry of Public Utilities and the Environment. 
We have even heard ourselves being described as a board of directors. We are constantly placed in the position of having to explain who we are and what we do, and that the commission is a court of law whose decisions can be appealed to the court of appeal. It is against this background that we decided that we needed to undertake a concerted public education initiative. To this end, we have produced a series of brochures and booklets, and I will name them. A Guide to the Environmental Commission of Trinidad and Tobago, A Guide to Applications for Deferment of Decisions Made by the Environmental Management Authority, A Guide to Appeals Against Decisions of the Environmental Management Authority, A Guide to Instituting Civil action, that is direct private party action, against other persons for violation of environmental requirements, and the two booklets, a guide to hearings of matters arising under the Environmental Management Act, and a guide to mediation at the Environmental Commission. I'm pleased to report that these brochures and booklets will soon be available in Spanish. As I pointed out earlier, the Environmental Commission of Trinidad and Tobago is the first of its kind in the region and one of the few in the world. Consequently, we thought it important to develop a website so that national, regional, and international recourse can be had on the operations of the Environmental Commission of Trinidad and Tobago. We have targeted the medium of television to enlighten the population of our existence and jurisdiction. To this end, the Government Information Services has facilitated the production of an info video on the Commission. Finally, the Commission, wishing to symbolize what we stand for, commissioned and, appro and approved a logo, the Environmental Scales of Justice, which will be our mark. It is our intent, through the informational material being launched today, to raise the level of consciousness about the existence, role, jurisdiction, and powers of the Environmental Commission. I wish to recommend that it will go a long way in assisting the public to appreciate that the nature to appreciate the nature and jurisdiction of the institution if there, was, if there were a name change to the environmental court. The institution is still in its infancy. Now is the time to set things right, to set things straight and get them right. A change in the name from environmental commission to environmental court will go a long way in the eyes of members of the public in their appreciation of the fact that we are a court an institution to which they can have recourse. At this juncture, I would like to introduce to, to you the members of the Environmental Commission. If you will stand, Her Honor, Mrs. Indira Ram Rikasing is the Deputy Chairman. Her Honor, Dr. Judith Gobin is the Environmental Scientist on the Commission. His Honor, Dr. Eugene Laurent is the Environmental Health Specialist. And Her Honor, Ms. Anne-Marie Serju is the Environmental and Industrial Chemist on the Commission. The enabling legislation provides for a fourth commissioner. We look forward to that post being filled in the not too distant future. I wish to acknowledge the sterling contributions of the former Registrar of the Environmental Commission, Mr. Andrew Dallip, in the preparation and production of the informational material, and that of the Registrar, Mrs. Nicole Ramcharan Ramdas. Distinguished guests, I thank you for your kind attention. May God's blessings fall richly upon you. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have with us today Dr. Winston and Anderson, the General Counsel to CARICOM. Dr. Anderson, who was born in Jamaica, is, has been educated at the University of the West Indies and Cambridge University, where he obtained the LLB degrees and PhD degrees, respectively. He became a member of the Honorable Society of Lincoln's Inn in 1988 and was called to the bar in Barbados in 1994. He's a senior lecturer of, of law, senior lecturer in law at the University of the West Indies, having been appointed there since 1988. He joined the Caribbean Community Secretariat as General Counsel in 2003. And he's now, as General Counsel, the Chief Legal Advisor to the Secretary General, the Secretariat, the organs, bodies, and associate institutes of the Caribbean community, 
The General Council also oversees the drafting of legal legislation for the community, mainly through the CARICOM Legislative Drafting Facility. And he advises member states of the community in relation to their intentional legal obligation to the community. With all those functions, you can see, ladies and gentlemen, we are lucky to have him here with us this morning. I'm sure a lot of people are looking for him all over the Caribbean. And Dr. Anderson will now come and speak to us on the importance of an environmental court. Dr. Anderson. Mr. Master of Ceremonies, Your Honor, Dr. Eugene Laurent, the, Your Excellency, Professor George Maxwell Richards, President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, the Right Honorable Mr. Justice Michael de la Bastide, President of the Caribbean Court of Justice, and other judges of the Caribbean Court of Justice, colleagues at the head table, Members of Parliament, members of the Diplomatic Corps, judges of the Supreme Court, both sitting and retired, members of the Environmental Commission, chairman of the Tax Appeal Board, honorable members of the Industrial Court, Mr. Orville London, Chief Secretary of the Tobago House of Assembly, Mayors and Chairman of Local Government Bodies, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen, Members of the Media. Good morning. Permit me to say first how very delighted and excited I am to be here in Trinidad and Tobago at this national launch of informational material by the Environmental Commission. The Secretary General of the Caribbean Community, His Excellency Edwin Carrington, a son of the soil here, has asked that I convey his personal regards to you, Mr. President, and also his best wishes to the organizers and participants for a successful launch. It gives me great pleasure to make these brief remarks in Port of Spain on the importance of the environmental court, because in my view, Trinidad and Tobago could reasonably lay claims to being the home of environmental law in the Caribbean. After all, it was here in Port of Spain in 1989, over 15 years ago, that CARICOM convened the first ministerial meeting on the environment that produced the Port of Spain Accord. Like the launch this morning, a primary objective of that conference was to increase appreciation of the significance of the issues and needs relevant to the management and protection of the Caribbean environment. The conference identified priority areas and problems and agreed that one of the strategic approaches to their solution was the development of legislative frameworks adequate to the requirements of sound environmental management. The recommendations from the Port of Spain Accord, as well as its partner, Environmental Consensus, agreed two, year, two years later in 1991, again in Port of Spain, received the virtual ratification in the 1994 United Nations Global Conference on Sustainable Development of Small Island Developing States held in Barbados in 1994. This conference, which adopted the Barbados Declaration and Program of Action, was in turn reaffirmed in a recently held Mauritius Conference, January 2005. Trinidad and Tobago holds the distinction of being a Caribbean community member state with arguably the most advanced environmental legislation in the region. The Environmental Management Act of 1995, which was repealed and replaced in 2000, creates vanguard institutions and procedures for the wise use of environmental assets. One of these structures is, of course, the Environmental Commission a specialist tribunal that handles some environmental disputes arising under the EM Act. Following the Trinidad and Tobago lead, the Environmental Protection Act of Guyana established the Environmental Appeals Tribunal. Both the Commission of Trinidad and Tobago and the Tribunal in Guyana 
are expressed to be superior courts of record, having power to enforce their own orders and judgments and to punish contempt as the high court. There is some debate about whether these bodies may be properly classified as environmental courts per se. A comparative study of environmental courts and tribunals in 11 countries presented in 1999, a report presented to the University of Cambridge, identified some 10 criteria that define general, generally what an environmental court is. And I think it is fair to say without going into the details that both the Environmental Commission of Trinidad and Tobago and the Environmental Appeals Tribunal of Guyana manifest several of these characteristics. In any event, the existence of these specialized tribunals raises the question, do we really need an environmental tribunal or an environmental court, or what is the importance of such a court or tribunal? Mr. Chairman, I think that there are several senses in which an environmental court may be seen as relevant and important to the task of securing environmental protection. In the first place, the environmental court may be seen as part of the architecture of institutional management of our environmental assets. In a sense, it completes the institutional arrangements for environmental management. A survey of environmental laws of the Commonwealth Caribbean commissioned in the late 1980s by the Caribbean Law Institute at UWI Cavell Barbados revealed that there were several institutional defects in respect of environmental management in our region. Since the publication of that survey in 1991, significant efforts have been made to redress the problem by creating lead environmental agencies having administrative or executive powers and functions. The first such agency was the Natural Resources Conservation Authority, NCRA, established under the Natural Resources Conservation Act 1991 of Jamaica. This was followed by the creation of broadly similar agencies in Belize in 1992, Trinidad and Tobago 1995 stroke 2000, St. Kitts and Nevis 1996, and Guyana 1996. An essential purpose of this legislation was to overcome the traditional fragmentation in environmental regulation by institutionalizing broad-based environmental management. In the words of the Jamaican legislation, the environmental agency was to take such steps as are necessary for the effective management of the physical environment so as to ensure the conservation, protection, and proper use of its natural resources. Apart from the administrative agencies, Modern environmental legislation also make provision for financial institutions necessary to support environmental management. And this provision is made through the establishment of environmental trust funds. Resources come into the funds from subventions from government, money is collected by administrative agencies as fees, payment for services rendered, grants from foreign governments and international organizations, loans from local or foreign lenders, endowments, and private contributions. The resources of the funds are, generally speaking, exempt from taxes and must be used to fund the operations of the administrative body. The judicial arrangements form the third pillar of the institutional arrangements. A major criticism of the pre-1990 regime was that judges were not always attuned to environmental concerns that they sometimes took the environment for granted and did not provide adequate relief in respect of environmental damage. The post-1990 environmental legislation thus creates judicial bodies for environmental adjudication in Trinidad and Tobago and in Guyana. The legislative scheme suggests that these environmental tribunals are specialist courts and as such have specialist tools to oversee the efficient management of the environment. Accordingly, environmental tribunals oversee the award of permits to undertake development or licenses to discharge pollutants. And they ensure that such conditions are attached as may be necessary to enforce broad environmental standards. 
Infractions may result in revocation, termination, or suspension of the license or permit. In this way, the Environmental Tribunal exercises regulatory control over economic activity. Mr. Chairman, Environmental Tribunals may also be seen as providing the forum where environmental considerations are properly and sufficiently taken into account in the decision-making process. As I hinted before, a perception exists, whether real or imagined, that many of our judges place a higher value on economic development than on environmental protection. This perception has been strengthened by several environmental law decisions. The anecdotal reports of the undisguised anger of a Trinidad and Tobago magistrate when asked to try a man for contravention of the Wild Birds Protection Act. The magistrate said anecdotally that the only crime that this gentleman was accused of was, quote, trying to feed his family. The fact that the first three attempts by Caribbean nationals to have the courts review official decisions that allegedly caused unlawful harm to the environment were dismissed on the procedural and technical ground that the applicants lacked standing. The fact that the first judicial comment upon the workings of the NCRA in Jamaica established under the legislation in that country was widely cited in the Jamaican press as evidence of the court's preference for commerce over the environment. It is noteworthy that this perception of lack of judicial zeal towards environmental protection is not confined to the Caribbean judiciary. Similar criticism was leveled against American judges in 1970 by the well-known environmental lawyer, Professor Joseph Sachs of the University of Michigan Law School. And at the international level, persistent criticism has led to the establishment of an environmental chamber to the International Court of Justice, staffed by judges with particular experience, expertise, and interest in the environmental field. What the environmental tribunal or court could therefore bring to the table in our region is an added sensitivity to environmental issues. And there are two such areas where sensitivity might be required, to which I'd like to point. First, <clears throat> there is the well-known debate concerning the proper role of the law of torts in environmental management. The law of tort, such as nuisance, is essentially aimed at protecting individual rights or rights relating to property. That protection offered to land owners against unreasonable injury to their land has obvious environmental implications but was not designed to promote environmental preservation as we understand that notion today. Many of the judges in the general courts who have considered the issue have been clearly reluctant to develop the law of torts as a means of protecting the environment. This reluctance was first exemplified in an American case, Boomer against Atlantic Cement in 1970, and also by the House of Lords in England in a more recent case, Cambridge Water against Eastern Counties Leather, 1994. Another example of an area in which an environmental tribunal might in fact play a pivotal role is that related to the standing required to bring common law actions to vindicate environmental rights. The requirement in most common law actions to demonstrate some sort of proprietary interest or show special damage remains a judicially self-imposed obstacle to environmental actions. After some indications of willingness by the English Court of Appeal to relax the requirement, the fundamental cautiousness was reinstated in the House of Lords decision in Hunter against Canary Wharf, 1997. There the House of Lords returned to the law of private nuisance as its original, uh, original objective of simply protecting under the proprietary rights of landowners. These are then two areas in which an environmental tribunal could make a big difference. Unfortunately, our environmental tribunals, as they have been constructed in the region, do not necessarily encourage development of the common law in these areas. For example, the jurisdiction of the Environmental Commission in Trinidad and Tobago 
is restricted to consideration of the operation of the EM regime, and therefore this would appear to rule out any competence to pronounce upon the applicability of the law of tort to environmental protection. Also, access to the Environmental Commission, although wide, is not unrestricted. The Environmental Commission does have a jurisdiction with respect to direct private party action instituted under Section 69, a provision which gives standing to individuals or groups expressing a general interest in the environment or a specific concern with respect to a claim violation of the Act. However, the right to start a private party action is limited to claimed violations of specified environmental requirements in Section 62. Furthermore, actions designed to scrutinize the stewardship of the EMA itself in the conduct of its statutory duties appear not to fall within the ambit of direct party actions. For example, if a member of the public is dissatisfied with the grant of a particular license, certificate, or permit, such a person cannot seek redress at the Environmental Commission, but rather must go to the general courts under the traditional rules of judicial review. There are therefore limits to what has been attempted, even in the foremost environmentalist CARICOM state. But this must not belie the advance that the establishment of the Environment Commission represents. Its orders will be respected and supported in the general courts. As said in the Canadian case of R against Consolidated Mabel and Mines, 1996, with respect to an order given by an Environmental Appeals Board in that country, quote, like court orders, administrative orders deserve to be respected and obeyed. Administrative bodies, be they public officials such as the director or tribunals such as the Environmental Appeals Board, regulate countless activities in society. Regulation of these activities is essential for the protection of individuals and groups in our society and for the prevention of harm to societal interest. The orders and decisions issued by administrative bodies thus form an important part of our law. Unless these orders and decisions are respected, the orderly functioning of regulatory justice will suffer. Accordingly, in pointing the way forward towards a forum in which environmental and developmental issues meet on equal footing and are given equal weighting, I believe that Trinidad and Tobago has done a service to the whole region. It is now a matter for the Environmental Commission within the limits of the mandate it has been given to define and develop an environmental jurisprudence that will inspire other jurisdictions within the community to wiser and more sustainable use of our environmental assets. I wish you a successful launch and may the information you disseminate be of tremendous benefit to our entire region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to hear an address from Mr. Martin Daly, SC. If I were to go through Mr. Daly's profile, I would have to be listed as, a, as having given an address today. So suffice it to say that Mr. Daly has been a senior counsel in Trinidad and Tobago since 1979, having been appointed one at the age of 35, which we think is a record for the Caribbean. He's a senior partner of the firm of Daly and Partners. He's a member of several boards. He has been an independent senator in the government of Trinidad and Tobago. And, uh, he has served as a temporary judge in the High Court. He's a weekly columnist in one of our weekend newspapers. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite Mr. Daly to the podium to let us know, to give us his opinion of the role of the Environment, Environmental Commission in the administration of justice in Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Daly.
Very good morning to you, Your Excellency, President George Maxwell Richards, and to the President of the Caribbean Court of Justice, Mr. Michael Labestein, to the Minister of Public Utilities and Environment, Chairman of the Tobago House of Assembly. Can I include everyone else in two or three general good mornings? Um, I'm not big on protocol, and indeed I'm not here to give an address. I'm here to have a little discussion. Um, so may I just say good morning to all other high office holders. Good morning to the differently abled. And last but by no means least, good morning to ordinary mortals. <laughs> now, the subject on which I've been asked to have a discussion with you will require some legal reference but I hope to keep it moist rather than dry. As has been recognized by the previous speakers, the Environmental Commission is a specialist court. Now, throughout the legal world, there are many specialist courts who assist in the administration of justice. I just read a list of the names of some of the specialist court, and the names tell you what they do. The family court, the Tax Appeal Board, the Industrial Court, the Environmental Commission itself. In the United Kingdom, we have the Commercial Court, the Technology and Construction Court, the Admiralty Court, the Patents Appeal Tribunal, the Pensions Appeal Tribunal. Now, it is obvious from the names and the description you have had of the Environmental Commission that the purpose of these special courts is to gather together for the purpose of administering justice in matters that are sufficiently complex or sufficiently out of the ordinary that a multidisciplinary approach is needed in the administration of justice and in the determination of the matters. Many of these courts develop their own procedures by which they may be accessed. They tend, in many cases, where the public is involved, to make the procedures more simply and more simple and less forbidding, um, all in an effort to make the role of the court more um, accessible, role of the court more easily accessible to the persons who need to use it. Indeed, the Commercial Court in London has been a spectacular success. It was formed in 1895. Um, I refer to this because there are a few lessons for us in the formation of it. It will also lead into something what, that I'd like to say about the models that may be used for specialist courts. The Commercial Court was formed in, or began operation in 1895, and curiously it was not set up by any legislation. We, we tend to think legislation is the answer to everything. There was a general feeling in the City of London, anecdotally at any rate, that the judges who were trying commercial matters didn't understand business. Um, with that delightful way of the English have of making understatement, I think the remark was made that the judge who was handling commercial matters at the time was not encumbered with previous knowledge. <laughs> so anyway, the commercial court was formed, and it was formed by a resolution among the judges themselves who agreed that there was need for such a court. In much more recent times, it's been put on a statutory footing, but it established itself arising out of a resolution of the judges, and indeed um, makes quite a lot of money for Britain in that many international contracts expressly choose London as the English law, as their choice of law and um, jurisdiction in England in the event of disputes. So it actually is an invisible export and make it's quite a lot of money um, for England, and I noted with interest what Dr. Anderson was saying, and perhaps we can start thinking, after I've given a critique of some of the deficiencies of the legislation affecting the environmental court, it's something that we may be able to sell um, throughout the Caribbean. Now, I'd like to say something about the models that may be used for specialist courts. As I've already indicated in my reference to the commercial court, they can be done simply by um, resolution, and that is to say that within the, the centralized, if you want to call it that, administration of justice of the Supreme Court, the judges may decide that they would like to assign business in a certain way better to assist the flow of work. 
So that, for example, if you take the, so that you can have a you can have a specialist court that is simply done by way of assignment um, by the head of the judiciary. The family court, I understand, is operating now on the basis of two or three judges who have been assigned by the chief justice to do that work. I believe initially for one year. Um, of course, you can also, and a number of these courts in England, the Commercial Court, the Technology Court, the Admiralty Court, it's all done by assignment of, of persons outside of the regular cadre of, of high court judges. Another model, of course, is the one that we have um, in the case of the environmental work, which is to set up a separate court with the powers of the, some, not all of the powers of the high court, and that is something I'd like to discuss later on. The other one is to set up a court in a statutory model and um, the industrial court is something of a hybrid in that um, although it is separate, set up under a separate statute, the president of the industrial court is exp expressly mentioned that the president of the industrial court might be a judge of the Supreme Court and indeed I believe the industrial court here was when it started was headed by Saiza Kaatali who was then a judge of the Supreme Court, if not, I believe, a Court of Appeal judge, who subsequently went on to become a Chief Justice. So those are the options available for specialist courts. The fact is that we have now set about, in the case of the Environmental Commission, to set up this court um, pursuant to a separate statute. Um, I just pointed out that there are other ways of doing it. Because one of the things that concerns me about all of the specialist tribunals in Trinidad and Tobago, including the Environmental Commission, is even though they are legislated to be superior courts of record, in fact, uh, they are features of, and they're supposed to be similar to the High Court, they are features of the High Court that are singularly lacking from their legislation, and I'll return to those. And that is one of the problems of a statutory model. And I'm going to suggest in the end that all of these specialist tribunals, including the Environmental Commission, suffer from what seems to be a generalized fear of the legislators in really making a superior court of record, a proper high court, instead of a two-thirds of a high court, a half a high court, a three-quarters high court, a seven-eighths high court, and we'll see some examples. And I think that is one of the difficulties that the Environmental Commission will labor under as it seeks to do its work. Now, and I generally do not believe, so that the role of the Environmental Commission is, as I've indicated, to assist in the general administration of justice and to do so by reference to a, a jurisprudence and a procedure of its own which it will develop within the confines of the, 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 the means by which it is set up. Turning specifically now to the Environmental Commission, the point has already been made that um, there are limitations in its jurisdiction, and I'm going to deal with a few of those and to show how that limitation, those limitations in its jurisdiction prevent it from being a full assistance in the administration of justice. What I would suggest, um, to save me having to be a boring lawyer and refer to section this and section that, is I'd like to suggest that in the fullness of time, everyone might look at some of these brochures that are in the package that you have been given. I picked three of them out because they will assist me in what I would like to discuss this morning. One is a guide to appeals against decisions of environmental authority. One is a guide to instituting civil actions, direct private party actions against other persons for violations of environmental requirements, and the other is applications for deferment of decisions made by the Environmental Management Authority. And that, in essence, summarizes for you both the original jurisdiction as well as the appellate jurisdiction of the Environmental Commission. I have no doubt that it is, it is wise, and I, indeed I think that our colleague Dr. Anderson has articulated very succinctly and very well the wisdom of having a specialist court to deal with environmental matters. It's not simply the fact that you will have a multidisciplinary approach um, as a result of the qualification of its members, it is the fact that you would expect a court like that almost instinctively to hold a fairer balance or a more even balance between the requirements of commerce and development and the requirements of the environment. Indeed, I think 
a great deal of emphasis needs to be placed on using the word development. Because in a so-called developing country, the real pressures against the environment come as a result of the requirements of the country to develop and therefore to maximize on whatever natural, res if it's blessed, fortunate enough to have natural resources, to maximize the use of the natural resources. And quite frankly, outside of the persons who are specifically concerned about the environment, there has been very little debate about where the balance between development and protection of the environment should lie. Um, and that leads me now to one of the main drawbacks in the uh, role of the Environmental Commission. Now, I'm happy, well, I'm always happy to see my Lord, Mr. Justice Nelson, but in fact, he's very relevant to something that I'd like to discuss. Dr. Moore indicated and when he was discussing the environmental court, that one of the limitations of the jurisdiction of the environmental commission was that persons who, I'm not using his exact words, persons who were aggrieved by decisions of the environmental authority had limited access to the environmental commission and did not appear to have access through the direct party action route, which you will see set out in this brochure. Um, and he referred to the fact that um, attacks or challenges to decisions of the Environmental Management Authority still had to be made through the judicial review process in the High Court. May I say I'm in complete agreement with that point of view. Um, my agreement with that point of view was firmly and robustly tested by my Lord Mr. Justice Nelson in a case that was done in the Court of Appeal recently and actually will be, um, is on for trial in the Privy Council in, I think it's May, the middle of May this year. And I think that that, if, the, if that view is right, I think that that is a matter that needs to be urgently examined. I do not believe that the Environmental Commission will be able properly to carry out its role to assist in the administration of justice if challenges to what the EMA has done in the course of granting a CEC cannot be made to the Environmental Commission. And it appears to me, and I am fortified um, by what has been said by um, Dr. Anderson, that this is so. And so I am recommending that the jurisdiction section of the Environmental Management Act that deals with the, what the Environmental Commission can and cannot do be amended as a matter of urgency to provide for a general right of appeal to the Environmental Commission by persons aggrieved by a decision of the Environmental Management Authority. It appears to me, although I must say that my Lord Mr. Justice Nelson expressly reserved his position on the matter, it appears to me that the rights of appeal that are at present contained in the Environmental Act, that rights of appeal to the Commission are, are worded in such a way that an ordinary person or a person aggrieved by what a decision of the Environmental Management Authority cannot actually go to the Environmental Commission and is driven to go to the High Court. Now, that is also relevant um, in the overall context of specialist tribunals, simply because um, groups, interest groups, and environmental groups uh, generally do not have, are generally intimidated by high court proceedings. They generally don't have the money for high court proceedings. And it would be far better if the disputes that those groups had with the Environmental Management Authority were refereed or arbitrated or mediated by a specialist tribunal containing a multidisciplinary approach. That is not to say that our judges will not do an excellent job in judicial review proceedings, but it simply isn't appropriate given the, 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 the broader questions that, ari that, that arise in decisions of the Environmental Management Authority. And certainly, um, there is a, a very compelling need 
to have persons other than lawyers or persons other than judges looking at the issues that arise when the Environmental Management Authority grants a certificate of environmental clearance. So that is something that I believe needs to be dealt with as a matter of urgency. Um, assume, because at very least the position is doubtful and it ought to be cleared up. Now, another matter which I would like to mention um, I'm afraid I'm an intensely practical person, so I'm not likely to cite judgments and high pronouncements of judges. Another matter that needs to be carefully considered in relation to this commission is that it does, even in the matters over which it has jurisdiction, it is dealing with big money and big ticket items and the big issue of, develop, of the balance between development and environment protection. And it does not seem to me appropriate that the members of the commission, and I agree that the name should be changed to a court to avoid any doubt, it does not seem to me appropriate that the members of the commission should hold short-term appointments. I, I think that is quite wrong, and I think that that is another deficiency in the legislation that needs to be corrected in order for this commission to play its proper role. Now, I may say in passing, uh, well, as I indicated before, that is one of the difficulties or one of the, the matters that we have not faced squarely in respect of all of our specialist tribunals. We are discussing it today in the context of the Environmental Commission, but if you study the legislation carefully relating to the Tax Appeal Board, the Industrial Court, etc., you will see that although they are said you are a high court and they, they, like, they have all the nice words about subpoena and I don't know, well, I suppose we can't legislate in Latin. If we could, we might legislate in Latin to make them look good. But on the most fundamental issue of all, the question of the tenure of these judges um, is not satisfactory. I can't say more about it because I'm involved in major litigation in which I'm representing the state in which these, the tenure provisions of the industrial court are being challenged. But as an assistant or in the administration of justice, certainly in this area that I repeat, I'm a very blunt person, certainly in this area where big interest, big money, and big ticket items are involved, it's totally inappropriate to have the judges of the Environmental Commission on short-term contracts. I, I live in the real world, and I hear a lot of talk about separation of powers and separation of the alcohol from the soft drinks. I don't believe it really happens. So I think that is something that needs to be looked at in the context of the role of the Environmental Commission in the administration of justice. Now, the last point which I would like to deal with um, is that I think it's very important that I, I think something very important was said by Her Honor uh, Miss Sandra Paul. I heard her say that yes, they have been busy, and she listed some of the things they have been busy doing, unfortunately, because of the deficiencies in the legislation. The two major pieces of litigation that have arisen out of development in this country have had to go to the High Court um, and have not gone to the Commission, and that's what they should have been busy doing. Um, and they, they, are, they are passive bystanders in that, and I, I've indicated why that is wrong. But I did notice with interest the list of other things that they have been doing. And she mentioned the fact that the Environmental Commission had had a stakeholders meeting. and. This was music to my ears because, and of course, when I received, well, let me say why it's music to my ears first and then I'll make the apology. Because um, in many of the specialist courts in the, some of the bigger countries, they have users groups. And they, they, that means that the administration of justice is not on a head table. I, I saw and you notice I didn't do it. I, I so dislike saying members of the head table, and that's why I include ordinary mortals in my good mornings. Um, I so dislike the idea that in modern times, the court is up here, and the people who are using it are down there. 
And it's long been recognized that for courts to function properly and to, have to continue to have legitimacy and credibility, they must be res responsive to the needs of the users. So I congratulate you, Madam, for having had a stakeholders meeting. Uh, referring again to the commercial court in London because it's such an outstanding international success, there is actually a commercial, use, uh, commercial court users committee um, which has an input into what is done and so on. And I think that is very important, again, in the context of the types of matters which the with which the Environmental Commission must deal. So to summarize the role of the Environmental Commission as I see it, I agree with Dr. Anderson that it is very much a step in a progressive direction. That is to say, to have a specialized tribunal dealing with matters concerning the environment. I believe that it is appropriate that you should have a, multi a court comprised of persons of disciplines other than law so that you will have a multidisciplinary approach to these problems. That, in, that, that you will build into your court by having persons of these different disciplines a greater sensitivity to the environment and, a, and, and probably an instinctive reaction to holding the balance more evenly between development and the environment. I think that the role of our Environmental Commission in the a General Administration of Justice is at the moment severely hampered by A, um, the better view, and I say this with the greatest respect to my Lord, the better view that challenges to uh, decisions of the Environmental and Management Authority are not covered um, by the legislation and by the tenure provisions. And I suppose everyone's a little concerned that I've not said anything controversial, but no, I'm feeling well, I'm, I'm normal. Um, but I would, I, I would say this. The reason I'm harping uh, uh, at such a great extent to holding the balance between development and the environment is that I, by force I became a practitioner in this field. Um, and you know, it is quite clear to me that there is a tremendous paradox or tension in the whole question of environmental law and legislation. Because the, those who control our economic destiny, um, at least those who control it from abroad, uh, come from countries that insist that if they are going to do business with Trinidad, countries like Trinidad and Tobago, there must be environmental legislation. So they insist that we have environmental legislation that has the potential to curb their business activities. But then when the environmental legislation is set up and the potential curbs to business activities in place, they're sometimes quite vexed. And they're quite vexed with the environmental authority and they're quite vexed with the commission. And here is where I'm certainly not going to discuss now the need for harmony in judicial bodies um, for fear that that may be extrapolated to matters that don't concern us this morning. And, but there is this tremendous tension that we, we have to have environmental legislation, but the people who are going to be most affected by it are the people who are the most likely to be vexed with it. They are the people who are most likely to make proper, and I emphasize proper, representations to the politicians to make the authority do this or make the commission do that. And of course, you have a commission or a court that has, me that has members on that have tenure provisions that are unacceptable. Indeed, one of my treasured friends and colleagues, Professor Kenny, has pointed out how frequently projects are announced way in advance of anyone even ha putting one slip of paper through the door of the Environmental Management Authority as though it simply doesn't exist. And so, for all of those reasons, it is really very important to ensure that both the original and appellate jurisdiction of the Environmental Commission is as comprehensive as it can be, and that the members of the Environmental Commission are sufficiently insulated from the considerable pressures of having to deal, and I make no apologies for saying it again, big money and big ticket items. Once those things are rectified, I am quite certain that the Environmental Commission 
will be able to be of considerable and effective assistance in the administration of justice in Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Daly. I'm sure several people are grateful to you for coming out in the open and say what they've been shushing about for several decades. And I do not necessarily include myself in that group, ladies and gentlemen. And ladies and gentlemen, as you're aware, the Environmental Commission falls under the umbrella of the Ministry of Public Utilities and the Environment. As a result, I will now ask the Honorable Penelope Beckles, Minister in that ministry, to address us. Professor George Maxwell Richards, President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. The Right Honorable Mr. Justice Michael de Labastide, President of the Caribbean Court of Justice. My cabinet colleague, the Honorable Mr. Eric Williams, Minister of Energy. Her Honor Sandra Paul, Chairman of the Environmental Commission and other members of the Commission. The Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Public Utilities and the Environment, Mr. Earl Nesbitt. Chief Secretary of the Tobago House of Assembly, Mr. Orville London. His Worship, the Mayor of Port of Spain, Old One. Murchison Brown and other mayors and chairmen of local government bodies, members of a legal fraternity, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, members of the media, good morning. Since I started my ministerial, ministerial portfolio almost three years ago, I've never had the feeling of being in a court except this morning. Um, and in a sense, <clears throat> I probably wish I was, so that I could apply for an adjournment either from Mr. Delabasid or Lord Nelson, um, so I can have the opportunity to respond to Senior Counsel Martin Daly. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have no such opportunity. But I want to thank him for all his suggestions and recommendations, which I'm sure he knows that I will give great consideration. As the minister with responsibility for the environment, it is a great pleasure to be here to make some brief remarks on the occasion of the launch of the Environmental Commission's information, informational material. I'm sure that we all agree that proper management of the natural environment of Trinidad and Tobago is vital to our overall socioeconomic growth and the health of our citizens. The environment impinges on every aspect of our lives, from the quality of the air we breathe to the water we drink. In this regard, sustainable development encompassing the protection and conservation of the environment continues to be a major plank of the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago's long-term strategic plan of attaining developed country status by the year 2020. To this end, the ministry has sought to put in place an appropriate institutional and legal framework for the protection of the environment. The enactment of the Environmental Management Act which established the Environmental Management Authority in 1995 and the Environmental Management Commission, which became operational in 2000, are just two examples of the many initiatives in the areas of policy development, legislation, and institution building. The enactment of the Environmental Management Act provided the basis for the introduction of an orderly regime for the administration of over 100 pieces of legislation relating to the environment. The Environmental Management Authority has responsibility to coordinate, facilitate, and oversee execution of an effective environmental regulatory program to promote public awareness and develop an effective environmental regulatory program. 
Ladies and gentlemen, as a result of the regulatory function bestowed upon the Environmental Management Authority, there arose a need for a specialized judicial body to which the decisions and actions of the Environmental Management Authority may be challenged. To this end, the commission was established on October 30, 2000, with an appellate jurisdiction with respect to decisions of the Environmental Management Authority. The Environmental Commission has been in existence for just over four years, and as Her Honor Sandra Paul, Chairman of the Environmental Commission, indicated, very little is known publicly about its functions and operations. It is in this context that I wish to congratulate and express, express my appreciation and support to the efforts of the Environmental Commission to develop, for developing this package of information material, including brochures, booklets, and a video designed to inform the public about the Commission, its functions, powers, and jurisdiction. This information package is an important step in empowering the public to access the services of the Environmental Commission. In this regard, I am especially pleased with today's launch as an initiative which is intended to improve the provision of service to the public of Trinidad and Tobago in respect of the environment. This focus on quality services is the goal of the Ministry of Public Utilities and the Environment and is integral to our own strategic direction, and I am pleased to be here today to endorse similar initiatives of the Environmental Commission, which is a key partner of the Ministry in the protection of the environment. In fact, I would like to take this opportunity to briefly share with you the legislative agenda of the Ministry as it relates to the environment which impacts on the jurisdiction of the Commission, which may provide some additional insight into the services of the Commission. The Commission exercises appellate jurisdiction as conferred upon it by the Environmental Management Act, including subsidiary legislation under the Act. The subsidiary legislation that has been enacted to date under the Act includes, among other things, the Certificate of Environmental Clearance Rules 2001, the Certificate of Environmental Clearance Fees and Charges Regulations 2001, the Certificate of Environmental Clearance, the Noise Pollution Rules, sorry, 2001, the Noise Pollution Control Regulations 2001, the Environmental Sensitive Areas Rules 2001, the Environmental Sensitive Rules uh, 2001. Ladies and gentlemen, although the subsidiary legislation under the Environmental Management Act that has been enacted provides for the protection of certain aspects of the environment in a fairly comprehensive manner, there are still some critical gaps. Some of the pr priority areas for the ministry relate to water and air pollution and non-hazardous and hazardous waste management. These pieces of legislation, which include the water pollution, air pollution rules, and the beverage container deposit bill, will be brought before the Parliament once the National Environmental Policy, which is currently being revised, is itself laid before the Parliament. The process of revising the policy is well advanced and is expected that it would be laid in the Parliament shortly, as it is required that the environmental policy be reviewed every five years, the last review having taken place six, some six years ago. The dynamism in the development of the legislative framework related to the environment makes the launch of the Environmental Commission information package all the more important and timely and also emphasizes the need for more and more continuously upgraded information to be made available to the public of Trinidad and Tobago with respect to laws pertaining to the environment. In closing, I therefore again extend my congratulations to the Environmental Commission and thank them for their commitment in playing this important role in public education and awareness on environmental matters. I wish you every success in this public information initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now have uh, another short interlude, and we will hear a poem that was written 
and it's going to be recited by Master Jean-Claude Bihari. His Excellency, Professor George Maxwell Richards, President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Jean-Claude Dimitri Bihari from Presentation College of Guanas, and today I'll be reading to you my first place essay in the Inter-American War Today 2004 competition, Water and Disasters, Both Friend and Foe. Last May, I visited my pen friend Vishnu in Jamalpur, a small agricultural village in the state of Bihar in eastern India. Vishnu made life on the bank of a stream south of the Ganges River seem filled with escapade, adventure, and beauty, interrupted with tragedy, hardship, and desolation. He had given magnificent sketches of Jamalpur, where water supported the pristine forests and wildlife. Water was used for transport, food production, and income, and for domestic purposes. He had also given catastrophic reports of destruction and water-related disasters such as droughts and floods. Enthusiasm and excitement filled me as Vishnu and his uncle Ruplal greeted me in Calcutta. We journeyed to the impressive Ganges where we boarded a small boat. The river was used for transport, communication and trade with surrounding villages. Farmers were seen transporting produce to sell in Bangladesh. Additionally, the water played an essential role in producing food and providing income. Some farmers were irrigating their crops, while others provided water for their livestock. Many people were also seen fishing and hunting. Two kilometers along a tributary, the boats ran aground in the receding waters, and we were obliged to walk to the village. Here, water was used for domestic purposes and sanitation, sometimes adversely affecting the health of the villagers. Women were seen transporting buckets of water, which were boiled and used for drinking, bathing, and cooking. The village was situated against a backdrop of lush forests, abundant with activity. It consisted of 90 adjupas precariously perched on a bank of the river. Some villagers were seen bathing in small pools, while others washed dishes and clothes. Five weeks' vacation had passed, when several children died from cholera after drinking contaminated water and the villagers became fidgety. It was three months now that no rain had fallen, and the pools in the river nearby were dry. Every day we trekked several kilometers seeking our friend water. It was the worst drought experienced, and there was an exodus of most villagers and livestock downriver. Without water, the trees became bare, the ground parched, and the landscape littered with dying livestock and crops. The situation became intolerable, and the remaining villagers decided to leave the following day. That morning, I was awakened by the cracking sound of thunder as streaks of lightning illuminated our thatched roof. Then, the annual monsoon rains came and hammered our hut unceremoniously. The river swelled with muddied water, and we were forced to seek shelter uphill. The force of the water eroded the soil and removed crop remains. Vishnu's father and other men returned to the village to retrieve and rescue the livestock. Then, the earth trembled and screamed as she gave way. A terrible landslide removed the entire village and the river consumed it. We looked in disbelief as the men and livestock perished in a terrible mudslide. After the rain subsided, the entire valley was silenced. We were subsequently rescued by a helicopter. Like hollow logs, we sat and stared down at the abyss of death and wreckage caused by the landslide and flood. Furthermore, the negative environmental impact and de devastation caused by soil erosion, landslides, and deposition of silt on the fragile ecosystems was a horrendous sight. Our companion, that once provided excellent health, food production, and income, was now transformed into an opponent, imposing unrelenting fury and destruction. In Jamalpur, water-related disasters such as periodic droughts Annual floods and landslides inflict havoc and ruin. Conversely, the same water is intrinsic for the support of all life and activity. Water in disasters is your worst enemy and your best friend. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bihari. I apologize for referring to your essay as a poem. 
Uh, congratulations on your award. Uh, maybe you should try writing a poem too. You may have the same success. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, we, it is my pleasure to present to you His Excellency Professor Maxwell Richards, President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, who will give the feature address and launch our information material. Your Excellency. Thank you very much, uh, Master Ceremonies. His Honor, Dr. Eugene Laura, Commissioner, Environmental Commission. The Right Honorable Justice Michael de Labestide, President of the Caribbean Court of Justice and Dr. and Justice Ralston Nelson of that court. The Honorable Penelope Beckles, member, Minister of Public Utilities and the Environment, other members of the Cabinet and of the Parliament. Her Honor Sandra Paul, Chairman of the Environmental Commission, uh, her Honor Indira Ramrekasing, Deputy Chairman of the, that Commission, as well as other members of the Commission, judges of the Supreme Court, members of the Industrial Court, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Mr. Martin Daly, SC, Dr. Winston Anderson, General Counsel to CARICOM, the Honorable Orville London, Chief Secretary of the Tobago House of Assembly, and your worships, the mayors of the municipalities of Port of Spain, Chaguanas, and Arima, members of the media, other distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I am delighted to be present at this gathering and to speak on what I regard as an important matter. Today, however, I speak not only on issues involving the environment, but comment on one positive development. I therefore refer to the decision by the Environmental Commission to educate the public on the role of the Commission, on its particular role in dealing with the many challenges affecting our environment by way of the publication of a number of brochures and a videotape, and to deal with the legislative aspects of environmental management. As you know, the Commission has prepared a variety of well-designed and readable brochures. And I have gleaned considerable amount of information from them. The Commission, a superior court of record, was, as you have heard, established under the Environmental Management Act of 2000 with a mandate to consider and adjudicate on appeals against decisions made by the Environmental Management Authority and also to deal with a variety of related issues. In my view, and I'm strengthened in this view by Mr. Daly, there is now a clear need to revisit the provisions of this Constitution and to strengthen them. I have also had the opportunity to peruse the 2004 Annual Report of the Commission and took particular note of the matters which are before 
the Commission for Litigation. Deeply interested as I am in the many ecological challenges facing our small island state, I was heartened by the fairness of the various decisions. What do I mean by fairness? When examined, each matter had its own peculiarity, its own complication, so that, for example, with respect to noise pollution, the Commission dealt with a case involving the daytime playing of a trumpet and the nuisance of one who played her radio too loudly. With respect to what some might consider as more serious issues, the Commission considered cases involving the discharge of effluent into drains, water courses, and sewage treatment facilities, and on an intrusion into the Ner River swamp. The Commission, in my opinion, considered each case as being of equal importance, and whereas all the evidence I have are the summaries and the appendix, I have concluded from a layman's point of view that the Commission's approach to its work has been commendable. Although we have all expressed delight at the information thrust of the Commission through its print and video material, I would like to offer some unsolicited advice. What is needed in addition to this material is a massive public education campaign using the electronic media directed at the population in general, but at the school population in particular. I do not see it, or I do not see this as an incursion into the territory of the EMA. I regard it rather as a program designed to reinforce the work of the EMA by saying clearly that there are laws which must be observed by the entire population and also by large commercial enterprises, whether they be fat promoters, oil companies, poultry processors, food packagers, or other energy entrepreneurs. We in this country continue to be affected by the global crisis. In an address which I delivered to some Rotarians in October of 2003, I posited that climate change will impact on Trinidad and Tobago in four ways. Rising ambient temperature, sea level rise, severe climate change, and other extreme events. And I said on that occasion that we face the prospect of a temperature rise of some one to three degrees Celsius by the year 2010 a mean sea level rise of 30 centimeters by 2050, and a rainfall deficit of 15% by 2100. And this was based on the best available scientific data at that time. However, this prediction was grossly underestimated with regard to temperature rise. Scientists have recently reported that as at the end of last year, 2004, there was already an increase of one degree Celsius, which resulted in a significant melting of ice caps and the breakaway of large areas of ice in Antarctica. One area is said to be larger 
than the island of Manhattan. With regard to extreme events, shortly after the devastating tsunami which occurred in the Far East, there was a great deal of interest in active volcanoes in the Caribbean, and we have been informed that various plans are being studied for advance warnings of earthquakes and eruptions similar to those that exist to advise the region about developing weather systems. Of course, the question that arises is, having been warned of an approaching tsunami, what can we in fact do? The prospect of advising those who live or work on flat ground to move quickly to higher areas is terrifying and would hardly provide solutions. The most critical environmental problem that confronts the international community today is climate change resulting from global warming caused by excessive carbon dioxide emissions from the burning of fossil fuels. There is no irrefutable scientific evidence of the link between CO2 emissions and global temperature rise and the change in other climatic conditions consequent upon this. There is a growing number of climate scientists who associate climate change with abnormal and disastrous weather events, as for example, excessive precipitation. Though these events are often referred to as acts of God, it is clear that they are actually acts of man. In the name of economic development, man has been abusing the environment in a profound way since the end of the Second World War. But because of its resilience, it has absorbed the abuse. But with the environment, like the abused wife, there comes a time when she can take it no more and she retaliates. The environment has in fact begun to rebel, and it did so with a vengeance recently in the Far East and closer home in Guyana and Venezuela. Trinidad and Tobago has been spared the worst so far, but disaster lurks as we enter the dry season and the vegetation of the northern range becomes tender for those who callously set forest fires in their own selfish interest. The consequence will be even more landslides, soil erosion, and flooding. What we must do, ladies and gentlemen, is to recognize the fact that a lot can be done to prevent such catastrophic events. Consider, consider, for example, the terrible landslides and flooding which occurred earlier this year in our country as a result of excessive rain. Could it be that the recent landslide episodes are an indication that those who have been espousing the theory that our northern range is in crisis are correct. To me, it is an enigma that there are so many groups in this country dealing with the environment, and it seems that so little is being achieved. Many of these organizations and agencies 
are associated with the Environmental Management Agency. And for example, we have the National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan, the Caribbean Planning for Adaptation to Global Climate Change, the Demerara Road Project, which deals specifically with lead pollution, the Community Outreach Program, the Cropper Foundation, Pe People and the Northern Range, Friends of the Sea, the Trust for Sustainable Livelihoods, the Tropical Relief Foundation, Protectors of the Environment, Sandwatch, the Wildfowl Trust, and I am certain that this is not the entire list. Many of these organizations are associated with international bodies and some are universally acclaimed for the work they have executed. There is also a green fund established under the Finance Act of 1987. This fund is intended to make grants to community groups and organizations primarily engaged in activity related to remediation, reforestation, and conservation. But this fund needs to be activated and disbursements made in line with its mandate. It seems to me, therefore, that the time has come to begin a massive reforestation program which will alleviate land slippage and contribute in part to a reduction in flooding. Another issue which continues to occupy my mind is this. Has Trinidad and Tobago benefited in any way or made any changes as a result of participation and decisions at the Kyoto, Rio, and SIDS conferences? The answer is that we have not, primarily because of the reluctance of the developed countries to fund environmental action plans in the developing world. The North is blaming the overpopulated South for the global environmental crisis. The South is blaming over-industrialization in the North so that the result is a stalemate. Some funding is provided by the Global Environmental Facility administered here by the UNDP, but the North controls the purse strings and the quantum of financial assistance is minuscule. At international conferences, Trinidad and Tobago's delegates must function with extreme skill. Although we belong to the South, in terms of the north-south divide in CO2 emissions, the country must manage carefully the question of pollution if we are not to be perceived as being in the camp of the north because of our very vibrant oil and gas economy. Trinidad and Tobago has made an outstanding contribution to the cause of small island developing states, the SIDS as they're called, who are specially vulnerable to sea level rise associated with global warming and climate change. In the preparatory meetings that preceded Rio, a former minister of the environment spearheaded the formation of the Association of Small Island States, EOSIS, and sowed the seeds for SIDS to be recognized 
as a special category of countries. This achievement has been universally applauded. A national environmental action plan with a 10-year time frame was prepared under the auspices of the EMA in 1998 with World Bank funding. That plan was developed with wide stakeholder consultation and we need now to pursue this plan vigorously. For the foreseeable future, this country must continue on the path of oil and gas exploration and production. This, however, must be balanced by plowing back some of the oil and gas rents into global cooling activities the most effective one being reforestation, as proposed by the Tropical Relief Foundation. It is a fact that the biodiversity of the tropical forests specially equips it for sinking carbon from the atmosphere. Energy-based companies should therefore be encouraged to establish carbon offset plantations. And it is, it is noteworthy that the National Gas Company of Trinidad and Tobago has already developed plans for establishing carbon offset plantations using local communities. First Citizens Bank has also made a corporate decision to support community-based reforestation projects under its care program. Large acreages of degraded forest lands in need of reforestation exist, and it is my understanding that funds are available for this purpose. In this context, appropriate NGOs like the Tropical Relief Foundation could be assisted to implement its community-based reforestation projects. As a result, oil and gas wealth would be more directly injected into the local economy. This will certainly help towards economic growth with equity. In closing, permit me again to compliment the Commission for producing the array of brochures which have now become available and to appeal to those responsible to undertake a national multimedia campaign designed to inform and educate all concerned as to legal devices available to resolve a number of environmental issues. I now have great pleasure in formally launching the Environmental Commission's information material. Thank you, Your Excellency. I'm sure your advice will not fall on their affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd now like to draw your attention to the screen on your extreme right, where you will be given, you will see some of that information about which we've been speaking all morning. Mm. But there's a wheel of the information and the local media we expect. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the environmental commission that dropped. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to ask the deputy chairman of the commission, Your Honor, Mrs. Elira Amrika Singh, to move a vote. His Honor, Dr. Eugene Laura, chairman of today's proceedings, His Excellency, Professor George, chairman of the Environmental Commission, Honorable Eric Williams, Minister of Energy, chairman of the Tax Appeal Board, 
honorable members of the industrial court, my function here this morning is a simple but very pleasant one. That is to give thanks to those who have contributed in making this event the success that it has been thus far. Firstly, to his excellence and simultaneously augmented our appreciation of the environment. Thank you to foundations. During the course of your Fitia address, I was reminded most forcibly of two turns out in the moment of its consummation to be Natia's conquest of man. To you. To Mr. Martin. <laughs> to Mr. Martin Daly, Senior Counsel, you have impressed upon us the role of an environmental court and the different models of such a specialized court. We have noted your comments too and will be bearing them in mind. Thank you so very much. To Mr. Anderson, you have highlighted the crucial importance of an environmental court in a developing country such as ours. And you have emphasized the possible reconciliation of sustainable development with economic advancement. Thank you very much. And may I say at this juncture, Dr. Anderson, that your book, The Law of Caribbean Pol Pollution, The Law of Caribbean Pollution has met high favor among students and staff in the United Kingdom. In fact, I myself have used it. To the Chairman of the Environmental Commission, thank you for your inspiring words. And they are but one example of the leadership that you have brought to the Chairmanship of the Environmental Commission. To the Chairman of today's proceedings, you have done a wonderful job in navigating the ship during the course of the proceedings. To Keisha Codrington and to Master Jean-Claude Bihari, we thank you both for your superb renditions. You are both <laughs> You are both brilliant examples of the talent of our nation. While the Honorable Sandra Paul has expressed gratitude to the past registrar and the existing registrar of the Environmental Commission, I think that it would be remiss of me not to um, re-emphasize their contribution to this event. To Mr. Andrew Dallip, our former registrar, a special thank you. You most competently assisted in laying the foundation of this um, event, and you were instrumental in the preparation of the brochures here today. The baton was passed on to Ms. Ramdas, the present registrar, who has worked assiduously in, in ensuring that this event is a success that it has been. Thank you to both of you. To Mr. Harris, Mrs. Harris, Mr. Vera, Artbank, Script J, Pastor Hussein, the Government Pantry, the Government Information Division, the Management of Crown Plaza, Mrs. Laura, Mrs. Harris, we want to thank you for having all gone beyond the call of duty in ensuring that this event was what we wanted it to be. Thank you very much. To the staff of the Environmental Commission, a special thank you. To all of you who worked day and night to ensure that this event was a success, you could not have done a better job. Thank you very much. To members of the media, thank you for attending and for your commitment to the environment. To the audience, none of this would have been possible without you. Thank you most sincerely for finding the time to be here our heartfelt appreciation. And last but not least, we thank God for his grace and blessings. If I have omitted to express words of thanks to anyone, it has not been intentional, and I ask that you pardon my omission. Thank you very much. Thank you, Indira. 
Ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> I sure you are now convinced that we must always have a doctor in the Environmental Commission. <laughs> Anyhow, this brings us to the end of the formal part of this morning's function. We'll ask you to tarry a while with us and have some refreshments, uh, during which time I think um, you may use the opportunity to ask questions of the chairman, deputy chairman, and the other commission. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming, and have a good day.